Good afternoon and welcome. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Professor Andrew Murtha. Uh, Professor Murtha is um, a, an Associate Professor of Government at Cornell University. He specializes in Chinese and Cambodian politics, focusing on institutions, policy process, and the exercise of power. Um, Professor Murtha is also the Director of the China and Asia Pacific Studies Program at Cornell. Um, um, he Get, he got his PhD from here at the Political Science Department, and he has written three books, uh, The Politics of Piracy, Intellectual Property in China, Water Warriors, Citizen Action and Policy Change, and uh, this is the book he's presenting today, Brothers in Arms, Chinese Aid to the Khmer Rouge, uh, 1975 to 1979. So I had just told Professor Mutha that he is a book machine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he also has articles appearing in China Quarterly, Comparative Politics, International Organization. And so it is a great, great pleasure to bring him here today and for him to tell us more about his forthcoming book. So please. Thank you so much, uh, Yuan. And uh, I also want to thank um, Christiane Castro, uh, Kate Wright, uh, everybody at the Center uh, for uh, Southeast Asian Studies, uh, as well as the Center for Chinese Studies, which is co-sponsoring the talk. Um, and for all of you uh, who uh, came here on uh, such a nice, bright, sunny Friday. Usually I have to thank everybody for braving the, the snowstorms and the, uh, uh, but uh, this is, um, I, I was just telling John that uh, the weather in Ithaca was nice for a change over the past few days, and I was thinking it better be nice in Ann Arbor because I'm giving <laughs> up an awful lot to, uh, anyway, I'm delighted to be here. and. Um, what I, I have so much stuff to go through here that uh, I'm going to uh, ad-lib some of it. I'm going to read some of it just so that I can stay within the, uh, the time frame. Um, but hopefully uh, I'll be able to cover um, uh, the, um, the basics and some more uh, and then also open up um, uh, and have time for, for, for Q&A as well. It, the Q&A begins in 45 minutes or at 1 o'clock or... Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Um, not that that necessarily means anything, because it's uh, once I get into the zone, it. it uh, but but I'll, I'll do I'll do my I'll do my best. Um, anyway, let me start with uh, the conventional wisdom um, uh, in policy circles, and uh, uh, less so among, uh, among uh, academics of uh, of China, but uh, of uh, certainly of, of of many observers, is that. Uh, China has um, really in the past decade uh, or more has really uh, changed its way of doing business in the world. And it's really kind of reached out um, and engaged, um, kind of moved outward and, and engaged much of not only the developing world, but the developed world as well. Um, in China's go out uh, policy, uh, you have an increased uh, amount of uh, foreign direct investment, a dramatic expansion of uh, overseas projects, um, and um, uh, promotion of brand recognition of Chinese companies um, all over all over the world. Um, and we're familiar with a number of uh, uh, high-profile cases within the past 10 years or so. In May of 2005, Lenovo purchased IBM's personal computer division. Um, in uh, uh, February of 2009, Channel Co. increased its stake in the Australian mining company Rio Tinto from 9 to 18 percent. Uh, and um, uh, in uh, June of that same year, um, there was a proposed purchase of Hummer by the Sichuan uh, Tangzhong Heavy Industrial Machinery Company. And the list kind of goes on and on. Um, what Kind of the outcome of uh, kind of of all this is this 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 idea that China is inexorably rising, with China's increased exposure throughout the world is this 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 notion this assumption that um, uh, China's power and ability to shape events overseas is commensurate with its actual presence, um, and that's something that uh, in my talk I'm going to uh, question. Um, this is just some kind of I. Uh, uh, it's not simply, uh, I was also, uh, one other example is that uh, um, 
much of the reason why Australia was able to weather the uh, post-2008 recession had to do with um, Chinese investment in, um, in Australian uh, commodities as well. So the puzzle um, that I seek to uh, uh, address here takes us back a generation or more um, to the mid-1970s. Um, and just to lay it out, when the Khmer Rouge came to power in Cambodia in 1975, the new regime was utterly dependent on Chinese foreign aid, technical assistance, uh, and uh, investment to survive. Uh, what does that have to do with um, uh, what I've been talking about uh, um, China today? It's this notion that even though China at that point was a, a, a rising um, uh, kind of industrial power a nu with nuclear capabilities, and Cambodia at the time was literally a medieval uh, uh, kind of political, socio-political uh, regime, uh, China was largely unable to influence uh, Cambodian policy along um, several dimensions of Chinese aid and assistance. And that struck me as being somewhat um, strange and worthy of explanation, not simply to get a sense of understanding the relationship between China and um, the, uh, the regime in Cambodia after 1976 known as Democratic Kampuchea, uh, but also to understand the limits, perhaps, of China's contemporary uh, power um, in a globalized, in an increasing globalized world. So my argument, is this. Um, I'm, for me, yeah. <laughs> so uh, just like the saying, you know, if you're a hammer, everything is a nail, or everything looks like a nail. For me, I studied bureaucratic politics in China, so the answer to anything that has to do with China is, well, it's the bureaucratic politics, obviously. So my, uh, my argument here is that the fragmentation of China's political institutions combined with the deterioration of Cambodian ones during this time, resulted in China getting almost nothing from the bilateral relationship, uh, with some important uh, exceptions, which I'll also uh, uh, address today. And the larger implication of this is that China's experience with its first ever client state suggests that the effectiveness of Chinese foreign aid and influence, the influence that comes with it, is really only as good as the institutions that manage the relationship. So the organization of the talk is as follows. Um, I'm going to talk first about uh, sources because um, that was kind of a, a big part of the project. And I think it's something that uh, um, uh, you may appreciate um, um, uh, uh, getting a sense about because this was not, this is in, in a sense a very different uh, learning experience for me from uh, my previous projects, um, uh, which I'll talk about in just, just a few moments. Then I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the overall context of the relationship and then really focus on the three cases. The three cases are military aid, technology transfers, and when I talk about technology transfers, I'm really talking about low-tech uh, technology transfers, and then trade. Um, and then, uh, depending on uh, how much time uh, I have left, I'll either uh, uh, s speak at length in terms of conclusions and implications or try to build those into uh, the Q&A. So let me just spend a few minutes talking about sources. Um, one of the things that happened early on in this research, actually it was um, in January of 2010, was that the Chinese foreign minister at the time uh, declared that China never uh, uh, involved itself in the politics of democratic Kampuchea. So as a result, it was really impossible for me to go to China and ask people, I know that this didn't happen, but what happened? <laughs> uh, and so that was really something that um, uh, kind of threw a, a wrench in the works. Uh, but I was lucky because um, even though uh, sources uh, dried up in China, um, I was able to locate a bunch of sources 
in Cambodia, and particularly at the National Archives. Um, this just gives you a little smattering of, of them. Um, I prominently put um, the, um, uh, the uh, engineering uh, blueprints here with the Jimmy, uh, <laughs> which means top secret in Chinese. And of course, nothing uh, gets me salivating quicker than seeing these two characters <laughs> on a document outside of China. Um, so these consisted of blueprints, uh, shipping schedules, bills of lading, um, uh, uh, act, uh, bilateral agreements, um, mock-ups, uh, and all sorts of things that um, initially got me very, very excited, uh, except I, when I tried to make sense of them, I thought, well, my Chinese has really gotten pretty rusty because I can't make heads or tails of them. Luckily, um, neither could my native Chinese-speaking friends and colleagues um, because they were so technical in nature. Even if we were able to um, understand kind of literally what was, what was being, being um, laid out in these documents, it was virtually impossible to find out what the significance of them were. So to what degree could we say that these were um, projects that were cutting edge versus um, kind of giving some work units in China you know, an opportunity to, you know, keep the machines running because, uh, uh, so giving some kind of uh, uh, lower end um, assistance to Cambodia. I mean, all these things were, it was very, very difficult to know the scale of the project, the, the degree of, of, of um, how cutting edge they were techno uh, techno uh, technologically, et cetera, et cetera. So um, for a good six months, I was um, uh, twisting in the wind trying to make sense of them until um, I was able to uh, find some uh, Chinese expats who were working in Cambodia during, the time, during that time uh, and interview them. Um, and uh, so uh, some of them are in this photo. I'm not going to identify which ones they are, <laughs> but they're in this photo. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's not Hu Yaobang, um, uh, Yu Chiu Li, or uh, Wang Dongxing who are in the front row there, um, but uh, uh, they are somewhere uh, in there. And, and these people were able to actually breathe life into these into these sources and make sense of them in ways that were um, uh, that I, I could not possibly have done so on my own. Um, I also was able to meet with um, ex-Khmer uh, Rouge cadres who had worked uh, with the Chinese um, uh, in various different uh, roles. Um, um, in most cases, and actually in, in pretty much all cases, I was able to, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm bound to keep their identities um, uh, 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 secret and anonymous. But in some, in one particular case, I don't have to, uh, and that is, um, I've lost some weight since then. Uh, it, um, the actual party secretary of the Democratic Kampuchean Embassy in Beijing uh, during the Khmer Rouge era, a woman named uh, Yong Mun, uh, who uh, was, I, I didn't think I'd be able to get an audience with her, except she hadn't spoken Chinese in 20 years, and she was delighted to finally. Uh, um, and so um, she was, uh, like many of my other interlocutors, extraordinarily uh, helpful in terms of uh, uh, providing me with information. Uh, and then finally, I was able to benefit from diaries, photographs, articles, uh, uh, various types of uh, regional and functional yearbooks uh, 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 in China. Um, this is an example of a page of a diary of um, somebody who was working down there who took extraordinarily good notes um, and um, uh, really helped uh, make sense out of a lot of what was going on. And this is an example of a photograph that um, uh, my uh, uh, Chinese uh, sources um, were uh, 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 generous in, in, in providing me with. So this gives you kind of an idea of kind of the sources from which this project um, uh, uh, draws from. Uh, very briefly, let me just give a kind of an overall context of the relationship for people who might not be as familiar with uh, this period of time. Um, uh, first of all, what's really interesting is if you're looking at the Chinese side of the equation, when uh, the Khmer Rouge walked into Phnom Penh and other cities in Cambodia, China was very much, this is so this would be April of 1975, China was very much shifting to the far left. The leftists in China were ascendant. Um, Mao was still alive, barely, but still alive. Um, the Gang of Four and other uh, leftists were, uh, were, were, were very much uh, 
Um, on the offensive, and people like um, uh, Joe and Lai, who was um, uh, by then in the later stages of cancer, and his um, able assistant, Deng Xiaoping, were on the defensive. By the time the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia in late December of 1978 and early January of 1979, Deng Xiaoping and the other reform-minded intellectual, uh, intellectuals, the other reform-minded leaders um, uh, generally uh, had consolidated their power in China. So within the time frame of the three years, uh, eight months, and 20 days that um, uh, people in Cambodia refer to as the Khmer Rouge uh, rule, uh, China had moved uh, pretty much from one extreme of the political spectrum to another. So it's very difficult for us to really place China uh, as a kind of a single kind of inert entity um, as uh, um, uh, attaching any kind of kind of willful intent um, without uh, a considerable amount of uh, uh, conditions and, uh, and, and, and mitigating um, uh, 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 subordinate clauses because um, it was, China was very much a moving target and a work in progress. Um, one of the constants or one of the kind of close constants that was going on at the time is that uh, you had um, a, 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 an increasing proximity between uh, Moscow and Hanoi um, and uh, China um, uh, needed to secure some sort of um, uh, uh, influence in the in mainland Indochina to be able to uh, uh, provide some 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 sort of a pushback at the um, the, uh, the Soviet uh, Vietnamese axis, and so. Um, the uh, Khmer Rouge um, uh, takeover of Cambodia provided uh, uh, China with precisely that type of an opportunity. Um, in democratic Kampuchea during this time, you had, it, it was essentially, um, as China was moving from the far left to the, uh, to kind of the, 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 the uh, apogee of, of pragmatism, in uh, democratic Kampuchea, you really had you had a cycle of one purge after another, kind of going deeper and deeper to the core of the state itself, making the state weaker and weaker. So that gives you kind of a general uh, context uh, of of what was going on at the time. And so now I'd like to just uh, start talking about the about the three cases. Uh, the first has to do with uh, um, uh, military and and. The, um, there, there are two examples that I want to cite here in terms of um, how and why China was unable to influence uh, democratic uh, Kampuchean policy. The argument that I, that I make in the book and that I'll make briefly here um, is um, a bureaucratic politics argument. And, and what you have going on, as I found, was that in China you had the military, even though it was reeling from the kind of the later stages of the Cultural Revolution, which did not officially uh, uh, end until 1977, and the fallout from the purge of uh, Lin Biao uh, following 1971. By 1975, the military in China was fairly. Um, uh, it was perhaps the. Um, uh, it was fairly consolidated, and it was perhaps the least molested uh, of China's. Uh, three great bureaucracies, the other being the government and the party. Um, so it was a fairly viable institutional apparatus. Uh, the same holds true with democratic Kampuchea. So I'm going to talk about a number of different bureaucracies within the Cambodian regime. But the security apparatus, which I uh, treat um, as part of the, um, the uh, or, or, or as, as um, uh, the same as the security slash military apparatus was perhaps the most sophisticated, well-developed, powerful bureaucracies in the state. The result was when China expressed its preferences in terms of the types of uh, military projects uh, it wanted to see on Cambodian soil, uh, democratic Kampuchea was able to push back. The result was um, largely uh, stalemate uh, uh, until Cambodia uh, was able to essentially get what it wanted by China conceding. So let me give you two examples of that. Um, the first has to do with uh, an airfield, a uh, military center of the, of the country in um, 
uh, an area that it's the uh, the lower circle there in Kampong Chenang. Uh, originally, the Chinese had wanted the airfield to be up in the northwestern part of the country in Udor Mianche, but uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the Cambodians insisted it on being in Kampong Chenang. For China, either place would have been um, would have been fine. Um, this military airbase uh, appears to have been um, something with uh, that would help uh, increase China's force projection um, south and west. And so whether it's in northwestern Cambodia or central Cambodia it wouldn't have made much of a difference, except for one thing. Um, Kampong Chenang was close enough to Vietnam that made it which made it vulnerable. And in fact, um, in, um, the, uh, when Viet Vietnam invaded Cambodia in 1978, uh, uh, shells, Vietnamese shells um, bombarded uh, that airfield, um, which managed to stay in, uh, which was not uh, really damaged um, all that much. Uh, it was so well built um, that one of the workers who had, uh, who had, who had um, um, poured concrete uh, on the airport, uh, one of the Cambodian workers said that uh, the Vietnamese bombs were like chickens pecking on the runway. Um, I can talk more about uh, the airfield in, 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 in detail, but um, the other example that I want to give, so this is what the airfield looks like today. It's about uh, two kilometers, just under two kilometers long, um, and it, it's, it, it kind of rises out, kind of like Las Vegas, out of nowhere, you know, in the middle of uh, 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 a very kind of sleepy um, uh, uh, part of the country. Uh, the other example um, is has to do with uh, with with radar installations. Um, so um, I'm not going to engage in um, uh, pet peeve that I have of you know reading my own slides, but rather to um, especially because I'm going to get a lot of these Cambodian words um, uh, horribly wrong. But the the bottom line was is that uh, China wanted to have its uh, radar installations in the southwestern part of the country. Uh, where they could monitor again things in to the west in the Gulf of Thailand and beyond, um, as as uh, illustrated in the upper uh, 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 map there. Whereas the Cambodians wanted the radar installations to be along uh, mostly their land borders with Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos. And again, um, uh, the Cambodians got what they wanted, um, and China did not. Um, the only caveat here where, where uh, Democratic Cambodia did not get what they wanted was they insisted, especially after um, relations started to sour with Vietnam in 1977, they, 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 they requested uh, uh, over and over again the Chinese send troops, fighting troops, not just training, uh, training uh, uh, soldiers um, to help them um, uh, either fight Vietnam or deter Vietnamese attacks, and that's where China uh, drew the line. The second example uh, that I want to talk about has to do with technology transfers. And here, too, China did not get what it wanted, but for very different reasons. Uh, also based in institutions and bureaucracy, but with very, very different dynamic. In this situation, um, you had... Uh, and there, there's lots of examples of an urban infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the electricity grid that uh, uh, provided tantalizing clues of a possible kind of repopulation of the cities in Cambodia, um, uh, factories, um, uh, not just rubber, but all sorts of factories throughout the, um, throughout the country, um, Chinese and traditional and foreign medicine holdings uh, uh, in, in the country and, and, and in various warehouses. Uh, 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 in the capital and outside of it, but particularly the um, the, the case that I that I focus on in the book and here is the um, uh, perhaps the, the the jewel in the crown of Chinese technology uh, transfers to Democratic Cambodia, and that's the petroleum refinery in Kampong Som. This so that shows you where where it is the. Um, 
This refinery um, was actually built by the French and came online in November of 1968, um, but it had not only been uh, largely damaged and field stripped during the Civil War, um, but it also, uh, uh, the, the Chinese wanted to convert it uh, from uh, using oil from the Middle East to being able to process oil from the, the growing fields in Daqing in northeastern China. Uh, and so uh, they needed to retrofit a lot of this um, um, uh, so that um, the processing um, would uh, kind of meet with Chinese, with Chinese uh, needs. Um, what this would do, I think, more than uh, China's military um, uh, aid and assistance would be to lock uh, democratic Kampuchea into Chinese orbit. Um, the, the problem with this refinery um, is that or, or the, the reason why China was not able to get what it wanted out of the relationship through this refinery has to do with uh, not uh, a, a situation that you had with the military. We had both strong Chinese institutions and strong Cambodian institutions, but rather where you had fragmented Chinese institutions and largely, virtually non-existent Cambodian ones. So on the Chinese side, you had all sorts of uh, coordination problems between the various bureaucracies. Um, these, uh, the ministries of petroleum and chemical industries uh, often suffered from what my interviewees uh, constantly referred to as contradictions or maodun as a result of com uh, competing overlapping jurisdictions and various types of inconsistent organizational mandates. Moreover, as new discoveries of various hitherto unknown properties of oil were made in real time, previous scientific knowledge upon which some of the decisions on organizational structure in China were based had to themselves to be revised, necessitating reorganization of relevant policy institutions. Um, these contradictions were not simply the results of aggressive attempts to capture new, new jurisdictional uh, uh, mandates, however. They also um, resulted from situations where no agency wanted to uh, take on a costly or not terribly uh, exciting or beneficial um, uh, part of this, um, of, of this kind of overall um, assistance package. Um, and you had the work units, the design institutes, the production institutes, the actual technical agencies uh, that spearheaded these, um, these projects and who sent their workers to Cambodia scattered all over various parts of China geographically. So you really had all sorts of uh, coordination problems that because these were out of plan type projects, you didn't have kind of the default types of relationships that you would have um, in the planned economy. So that created another wrinkle uh, to all of this. Um, the result um, for the Chinese was a situation where the people on the ground either had nothing to do or were unable to do the things that they were charged with doing as the rapid deadline of 1980 for the petroleum refinery to come online loomed. Uh, and this just gives you an idea. These are some translations of some of the worker comments uh, at the time. Um, it was, uh, it gives you a very different idea of kind of socialist brotherhood. Um, it was really a, a situation where um, one of them described the, the working in Cambodia as being at war at the bottom of the ocean. On the Cambodian side, you had a number of problems as well. The economic ministerial units uh, were part of a gargantuan bureaucracy um, that uh, I've uh, uh, spent the better part of the last year and a half trying to map. Um, it involves, um, perhaps the best way would be just to um, uh, uh, read just a passage from, um, uh, from the book. Uh, the economic portfolio for uh, Democratic Kampuchea belonged to Deputy Prime Minister and Full Right Standing Committee member uh, Sok Tok, better known by his nom de guerre or Vornbet. 
He sat atop a bewildering array of shifting units that held a number of different official designations, ministries, committees, sections, which for the sake of smoother exposition I refer to as ministerial units or simply units. These changed over time, merging and decoupling seemingly at random. The units more clearly designated as ministries were industry under Chang'an, commerce, and public works under Tok uh, Pian. Agriculture under Nguyen Son, who was succeeded by Leve, all these people were executed, by the way, during various parts of the, uh, of the regime, uh, had their own committees but did not have a formal ministry associated with it. Similarly, the Railroad Committee was not a formal ministry, even though it was very large and increasingly important as time went on. Units did the, that did not have a minister and were thus not considered ministries were under the, under the dual leadership of the assigned committees and directly through the office of 870, which was where Pol Pot and the Standing Committee uh, 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 um, uh, uh, resided. Uh, these included railways, agriculture, energy, and rubber plantations. Moreover, uh, these units were not of a piece. Some were more centralized and under the day-to-day -day command of their superior ministries and the standing committee, while others were decentralized and responsibility for them was placed on the zone commanders and other local leaders. In general, commerce functions were both centralized, agriculture and public works were decentralized, and industry was both. In other words, agricultural production and water management were handled in a structurally decentralized milieu, while commerce and much of industry was coordinated directly with the center with little regard for location within the territory in democratic Kampuchea. So, the, and the only dedicated management team that was identified by the Chinese at uh, Kampong Som were a comrade, uh, Yi De, who was the Democratic Kampuchean cadre in charge of the refinery. He was assisted by a comrade, Gai, who was Ida's right hand. Uh, in addition, there was a comrade, Lo, who was vice director of the refinery in charge of production, and a comrade, Jia Mei, who was a vice director in charge of supplies and day-to-day -day operation of daily life. Gives you an idea of just the complete lack of uh, communication and uh, uh, control. As a result, the Kampong Som uh, refinery was an unmitigated uh, uh, disaster and an abject failure. Let me move on to the third case, and that is trade. This was the one area that I found where China was actually able to shape not just outcomes, but the processes that led to them. Um, for their part, uh, on the Chinese side, uh, the, tra the various trade bureaucracies that were involved had clear, relatively clear functional delineations of responsibility, uh, certainly relative to the ones that were, uh, that were handling the various inputs uh, for uh, the Kampong Som uh, refinery. Thus, they were a relatively coherent uh, side of the equation uh, that worked together with a somewhat viable Cambodian institution that uncharacteristically for the regime, was not averse to learning how to undertake a new set of state functions, even as these very functions arouse suspicions among the more hardline top leaders, but they too recognize the need for trade. As a result, China was able to make significant headway in shaping the process and even some of the structure of DK trade and commerce. So really, um, this just uh, shows you some of the initial shipments of Chinese uh, goods to Democratic Kampuchea. Really, the first ships arrived from China uh, two or three days after the fall of Phnom Penh. So this was uh, something that was very much the Chinese side was 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 ready and um, kind of able to uh, uh, to to assist in this task. On the Cambodian side, you had uh, a number of, uh, uh, of things that were, that were instituted um, on Chinese advice. Uh, first, there was a bank that was established to fac facilitate imports and exports. The Overseas Commercial Bank of Cambodia, ostensibly under the, quote, Economic Committee or the Commerce Committee. Uh, th again, this was instigated by the Chinese. Um, and according to uh, Sar Kim Lamut, who was appointed deputy director of that bank, 
he was instructed by his superior, Vaughn Vett, uh, that, uh, that he, somebody with banking experience, was needed to prepare a meeting with the Chinese side, with the Chinese trade delegation, um, down to the, uh, the detail that he should wear civilian clothing when meeting with the Chinese. Uh, the bank, such as it was, was located in the Ministry of Commerce compound, but it was not part of the ministry. Um, uh, it was organizationally separate, or more accurately, it was isolated. Uh, you had preteen messengers from the Central Communications Office dropping off documents uh, to and from the upper echelon for the deputy director to sign, but the bank itself was mainly for show and acted more as a notary than anything else. According to Sarkim Lamut, there was actually no, there was no actual money in the bank and transactions were handled by the Commerce Committee as the bank itself lacked, lacked any kind of accounting system. Nonetheless, over time, the bank uh, became part of, kind of a, a, a gradually growing infrastructure uh, that monitored trade, uh, not simply uh, Chinese uh, exports to democratic Kampuchea and Cambodian uh, exports back to China, but also the, um, the, uh, the creation of um, a, uh, an import-export office in Hong Kong. I'm going to run through this. This is um, the, the um, Renfeng or Yingfeng uh, uh, Import-Export Company was um, uh, founded in Hong Kong in 1976. Uh, it uh, included four uh, people, uh, four uh, cadres from Democratic Kampuchea. Uh, it was sent. Uh, it was based in the central district of Hong Kong, um, which is the, uh, the 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 commercial kind of epicenter of of the um, of the uh, then colony. Um, they all lived together in a communal apartment in Happy Valley, where they could hear the horse races in the background, which. Um, in other uh, circumstances might make for an interesting sitcom. Um, they, the uh, uh, Renfeng uh, was founded to facil facilitate imports uh, into and exports from democratic Kampuchea with countries that did not wish to be associated with uh, the uh, Khmer Rouge regime or which had trade restrictions leveled at Phnom Penh. So startup funds were provided by China in the form of loans with the accounts held in Chinese banks. Uh, the, um, the 140 million uh, renminbi uh, uh, account that China had established for uh, uh, Democratic Kampuchea was split between A and B accounts. Uh, the A account was per reserved for purchasing Chinese goods to be imported to Cambodia, and the B uh, funds were credits for Cambodian exports to China at the time. Uh, with uh, veteran revolutionary Van Riet at the helm, Renfeng uh, thrived as trade continued to expand. By 1978, uh, Democratic Kampuchea's trading partners included Singapore, Japan, Bangladesh, Madagascar, North Korea, and Yugoslavia, and even France, in addition to the considerable trade with China. By 1978, plans were even afoot to establish another import-export company in Singapore. Uh, it's important to underscore once more just how alien this was to uh, the top uh, leadership with the possible uh, exception of Yang Seri uh, and the considerable role that China played in establishing this commercial infrastructure. Okay, just in the interest of time, let me switch to um, kind, of the, uh, kind of the end game here um, and just, uh, if I can, read uh, one you know, final passage. Uh, after the Vietnamese invasion, uh, Kampong Som became noteworthy, again, not as the centerpiece of Chinese aid and assistance, but became, it became the site of a disorganized and panic-ridden ridden retreat uh, by the Chinese. News from Radio Kampuchea downplayed events. The Chinese radio broadcast had actually announced the defeat of Vietnam. But after hearing rumors from their Cambodian workers and listening to the BBC on a shortwave radio, the Chinese realized that all was not well. When informed that the Chinese embassy in Phnom Penh had been, quote unquote, relocated to Thailand and their passports deliberately destroyed along the way, the Chinese technicians truly became alarmed. 
Injured Chinese advisors who fled from hospitals in Phnom Penh reported that as many as 200 other immobile wounded Chinese were unable to leave and had become de facto prisoners of war. Refugee Chinese advisors trucked overland from Krang Lia, the airfield in Kampong Chenang, uh, joined the throng uh, on, their, on the exodus to Kampong Som. Uh, some, uh, the, the, um, after being delayed for two days at the port uh, because Yang Sari wanted to um, uh, uh, reload um, the latest shipment of Chinese military materiel to democratic Kampuchea so it wouldn't fall in the hands of the Vietnamese, um, the, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, and uh, some Cambodian uh, elites uh, set out to sea after 10 days there with all canned foodstuffs uh, and, uh, and <laughs> they made a note of telling me all the beer on the boat having been uh, uh, finished, uh, the ship arrived in the port of Guangzhou where exhausted evacuees were met by a receiving line of officials from the Chinese foreign ministry and the provincial government of Guangdong. Other Chinese fled to Thailand but re-entered Cambodian territory to link up with the Khmer Rouge in the jungle and maintain the legitimacy of the just deposed regime by having the Chinese embassy to democratic Kampuchea follow the retreating Khmer Rouge cadres into the jungle. Uh, to paraphrase Macbeth, nothing became the doomed Kampong Som refinery project and the Chinese experience in democratic Kampuchea more than the leaving of it. So what are the conclusions? As I mentioned at the beginning, really, the, if, um, if uh, this has kind of, if this story has generalizable legs, I would argue that they are that China, uh, in <coughs> extending its reach and its influence to countries in the developing world, um, is at the mercy not simply of the types of events that um, that that uh, uh, are random or un, um, unexpected, but also the strengths and the weaknesses of its own institutions for managing that relationship, as well as those in the recipient country. Now, for this story to really um, travel, uh, it assumes that fragmentation in China is at least as bad now as it was back then. I would argue for a number of different reasons, but I can get into that during the Q&A if you'd like, uh, that in fact Chinese fragment, uh, institutional fragmentation is actually worse now than it was back then. Um, and all of this I think has uh, a number of implications for China's international interactions with um, the developing and the developed world uh, today. Uh, and, the, and, and our uh, attention should be, um, I think, redirected um, to the efficacy of Chinese domestic institutions when we ask questions about Chinese behavior abroad. Thank you very much.